Wittenstein High Integrity Systems presents Coffee Break Training. Welcome to the latest series of Coffee Break Training videos from Wittenstein High Integrity Systems. In this series of videos I'm going to walk you through our downloadable demo applications. These are available from our website and include a fully featured demo showcasing the Safe RTOS API with a binary only time limited version of the RTOS. More information and additional training sessions can be found on our website. Follow us on Twitter at Wittenstein underscore Hiss for updates on new training sessions. As our demonstration code is fully featured, it may appear quite complex when first examined. Instead of diving straight into that, I'm going to talk through how a simple flashing LED task is created, instantiated into the main program, and how it's set running. This will help you understand our code structure and what's going on when we come to examine the full demo. Just so we're all talking about the same things, a task is a self-contained element of functionality. Once started, it will generally run forever. While it may seem artificially simple, a flashing LED task confirms quite a lot about the RTOS itself. This includes that the scheduler is working, that the system tick is running, and that we can create tasks and use API calls, and depending on the underlying hardware, it also tells us that the MPU is configured. For this video, we are considering our demo for Texas Instruments RM48 Cortex-R4 device. However, most projects will be very similar. Our demos ship with a common application structure, and most boards have at least one LED on them that can be user-controlled. The code to do this is usually in the common directory in flash.c. One of the benefits of using an RTOS is modularity of code and ease of reuse. If multiple LEDs are on the board, then one task is created per LED. Safe RTOS has no limits on the number of tasks that can be created in a system. Let's have a quick look at the task code itself. In fact, this code could stand on its own without an RTOS if there was nothing else in the system. The main functionality is in a while one loop. This delays for a period using the X task delay until API call, toggles a specific LED, and repeats forever. Remember, tasks should never return. The initial section of the task is concerned with using the parameters passed into the task to calculate what the toggle rate should be and which LED should be toggled. So how do we create or instantiate a task? Again, there's a simple API call to do this. It takes a basic set of parameters that provide some key information to the RTOS. Firstly is the task function code. This is the function we saw on the previous screen. Next is a name, just a character string, and this is used by the state viewer debug tool to refer to the task. Next, we have a TCB, or task control block. This is used by Safe RTOS to track state relating to the task, such as stack pointers and whether the task uses the floating point unit. Each task is likely to require some stack, and as a safety system component, Safe RTOS does not support dynamic memory allocation, so each task requires a stack buffer, as well as telling the RTOS how large this is. Then we can provide a structure containing arguments to the task function. Each task has a priority, ranging from idle priority which is the lowest in the system, to any level of higher priority. Tasks can share priorities, and this results in them being scheduled round-robin style when it is the turn of tasks of equal priority to run. Finally, each task may require some arguments that are specific to the particular microcontroller on which they are running. We'll look at these in a moment, but by splitting the task creation in this manner, it means that port-specific requirements can be contained in a single file. This allows easier code reuse across multiple platforms. This shows those port specific parameters from the previous screen. Remember, this example considers the RM48, so other demos may vary. In this case, the RM48 has both a floating point unit and a memory protection unit, so each task needs parameters for both of these features. The FPU is a straightforward true-false option for whether the task uses the floating point unit, but the MPU is generally more complex. Firstly, we declare whether the task is running in privileged mode or not. Generally, privileged tasks have unrestricted access to the microcontroller's memory, so most tasks should run in unprivileged mode. This allows tasks to be partitioned from each other, 
with the MPU hardware catching illegal accesses. To allow an unprivileged task to operate, some regions may need to be configured. As a minimum, this covers the stack used by the task, and also any GPIO required by the task. Although the Cortex-R4 MPU has eight regions, four of these are required by the kernel for the operating system to operate. This leaves four that can be customised for each task. One of the four kernel regions includes the stack for the given task. In this example we see two other regions are used. The first is a small data region for the task, for example to store any global or static variables. The second region covers the peripherals. To flash an LED we need to have permission to access the GPIO pins. We won't go any further into the specifics of setting up the MPU. That's a topic for a video in its own right. Finally, let's see how this all hangs together at the top level of a program. Firstly, we have a function that sets up anything hardware specific that isn't already handled by the boot code. For example, this could include configuring the GPIO, and it's always device specific. This is the first API call to set up the scheduler. We pass in an initial structure to set up the port. This function initializes various kernel data structures and sets up configuration parameters such as the tick rate and any hook handler functions. We then call the function to create the LED task that we examined previously. Other task creation would generally be done here too, although there's nothing to prevent the user creating tasks once the scheduler has been started. And finally, we can start the scheduler. This creates the idle task, configures the memory protection unit for its initial setup, and also sets up the timer interrupt that generates the RTOS tick. It then loads the context of the first task, starts the timer interrupt, and the RTOS is running. Notice that the API functions always return a status value. As part of the safety functionality, it is important to check for errors. The API has a list of error codes that can help track down problems if at any stage an API call fails. This video has shown an example so simple that it doesn't really need an RTOS. However, it is a useful way to start introducing the API as a precursor to looking at our demo code. In the next video, we'll add some more LEDs into the mix, and we'll see why an RTOS becomes an elegant solution, allowing modular design with easy code reuse and without having to worry about the complexity of scheduling multiple tasks with different operating parameters. Thanks for watching, and remember to follow us on Twitter for updates. In our next Coffee Break training video, we'll look at how the RTOS allows us to reuse our task code and extend the application to control multiple LEDs.